All right, good morning. Um, <coughs> we're going to start the third and final uh, morning session. Um, my name is Jeremy Fogel. I am a federal judge. I am the director of the Federal Judicial Center, which is located in Washington, D.C. Uh, we provide uh, education and policy research for the federal judiciary, and we're an a independent agency created by statute. Um, I want to start by just saying how happy we are to be here again. This is the fourth year that we've done uh, a collaboration with the National Constitution Center. Uh, it's really one of my favorite program is something I look forward to every year because it's an opportunity to interact with the public. It's an opportunity to bring uh, federal judges together to talk about uh, issues at the top line level, the things that really affect us uh, in all of the work we do, but we don't have time to think about because we're too busy deciding cases. And uh, I want to thank uh, Jeff Rosen and everyone at the NCC for being such great partners in, in putting these programs on. And just to emphasize something that uh, Professor McConnell uh, said, we do our work on a nonpartisan basis also. It's very, very, very important to us that it be that way. Um, so I want to introduce the two judges who are up here with me and who will be uh, talking with me about uh, another aspect of this topic of um, the judiciary and the, and the Hamiltonian vision. Uh, and that is statutory construction, how judges uh, interpret statutes and apply them. And so to my immediate uh, left is Judge Jeffrey Sutton. Uh, Judge Sutton is uh, on the Sixth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, they are headquartered in, in Cincinnati. Uh, Judge Sutton most recently was the uh, chair of the Standing Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure. So this is the uh, body within the uh, federal judiciary that uh, sets the rules uh, that all of us have to live by when we preside over cases and, and decide cases. It's a very, very significant role, and, and Judge Sutton was a, a superb leader in, in that. Uh, and he's a very distinguished judge on the Sixth Circuit, has a forthcoming book uh, about an aspect of what we're going to be talking about this morning, which is federalism. And to Judge Sutton's uh, left is Judge Robert Katzman. Judge Katzman is the chief judge of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is based in New York City. Uh, and Judge uh, Katzman has a distinguished career both as a, an academic and a judge, and he has a published book about statutory construction. And uh, I know both of these gentlemen well. They are absolutely uh, stellar representatives of the federal judiciary, and we're great. it's great to have them with us. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start with uh, Chief Judge Katzman uh, because he wrote a book on statutory construction and our topic is statutory construction, so it seems like a good place to start. Uh, and Bob, we're talking to a, an audience which is both uh, judges and non-judges, so you get into quite a bit of detail in your book about how you think judges ought to approach statutory construction, so why don't you start us off? Thank you, Jeremy, and, and thank you, uh, Jeff, as well, for, for having me in this grand place. Uh, so when I think about what uh, my role as a judge is in, in, in interpreting statutes, statutes being uh, the laws passed by Congress, I think first of all, of course, of the, uh, of the Constitution. What does the Constitution say about the judge's role in interpreting uh, statutes? I look at the constitutional document and I see that um, Article I is the legislative uh, branch article. And the Congress is the people's branch. And so I, as a judge, want to do uh, what I can in terms of interpreting the laws passed by Congress in a way that is consistent with what uh, Congress was trying to do when it enacted the laws of, of Congress. Now, what does the Constitution say about uh, uh, how Congress is, is organized and, 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 and what can that tell me about what I should do as a judge? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that the Congress is, under the Constitution, the Congress 
largely uh, is vested with the authority to determine um, its internal processes, its authority to figure out uh, what kind of lawmaking process it wants, um, how it should be organized, uh, what kinds of things should be done in terms of making that lawmaking process a reality. There are some things, of course, in the Constitution about the qualifications of, of members, uh, about the presentment of bills, about certain kinds of uh, bills emanating from the House in terms of taxes and uh, revenues. Uh, there is a requirement that there be a journal uh, uh, of proceedings kept in the various, uh, uh, in, each, in, in the chambers. But there is really, beyond that and some other things, very little about the lawmaking process itself. And that really is in keeping with uh, Governor Morris's uh, thought, uh, one of the founders, where he said, uh, we did the best we could. Uh, nothing human can be perfect and experience will help us figure out how and what to do next. And I think that uh, the Congress itself evolved uh, over time in terms of its, its uh, structure. Uh, by the 1820s, you begin to have uh, committees. You have the organization of Congress uh, evolving in different ways over time in both the House and the Senate, different kinds of rules. and. Uh, uh, regulations. Uh, you've got uh, a young political scientist, uh, Woodrow Wilson, saying in the 1880s that Congress uh, in session is, is Congress on exhibition, whilst Congress in committees is Congress at work. And that was the idea that the work of, of Congress gets done uh, through the committee process. So. Um, one of the things that, uh, in answering your, your, your question, uh, Jeremy, uh, one of the things that motivated me to, to write uh, judging statutes, um, to study judging statutes, was that I felt that um, there was a gulf in our uh, literature and our understanding about uh, what judges do, how they should go about it, and what the relationship should be between the courts and the Congress and interpreting uh, statutes. And, um, uh, and, and, and where I, I come out in the end is, is, is this view that our role as judges is to respect what Congress has done and also to respect the work product of Congress, to be respectful of the processes that Congress um, undertakes uh, and how Congress wants us to look at its work product. And um, so when I interpret a statute, I look first at the uh, text, of course. And the text is, 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 is critically uh, important. I looked at the statutory provision. What is it that I'm supposed to uh, interpret? I look at that particular statutory provision also uh, in the context of the larger statute that, that was, was passed uh, to get a sense of, of, of that exercise. Um, so uh, Congress passes a, a law saying that uh, reasonable uh, that, uh, attorneys, attorney's fees shall be provided to those um, who uh, have prevailed in a proceeding involving uh, education uh, for uh, uh, children with disabilities. So you've got kids who um, are in proceedings, um, their parents prevail, uh, and they seek uh, attorney's fees as part of the cost. And what they actually are seeking are expert fees that were incurred by the uh, families uh, in pursuit of their uh, legal case. If you look strictly at the statute, uh, the statute, uh, statutory provision talks about uh, reasonable uh, attorney's fees as part of the costs. It doesn't talk about expert fees. So in a strictly textualist sense, one might say, well, Congress didn't talk about expert uh, uh, fees, so therefore, 
uh, they're not included. But the exercise that I engage in uh, would be, I look at that, and that may be true. Maybe Congress uh, didn't want expert fees to be included. But I look at, as I always do, I look at that particular uh, provision in the context of the whole statute. And what does the whole statute try to do? The whole, what the whole statute tries to do is to um, uh, make it, in part, easier for parents to bring their, their claims. Um, so then, I'm, then I think, well, maybe, uh, maybe it's not so clear whether expert fees are, are not supposed to be uh, included. So what do I do next? I then look at um, uh, my toolbox of, of, of what I can draw upon in interpreting a statute. The toolbox consists of lots of different things. Uh, there's the text, of course, which is critically important. There is the structure of the statute, which is critically uh, important. I might look to the canons of, uh, of statutory uh, interpretation. I might uh, look at uh, common law usages. I might look at uh, uh, specific uh, 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 technical uses of a, of a statute. I look at uh, Supreme Court precedent. As, does, has the Supreme Court, uh, for example, or my own court, um, said something to guide me in thinking about how I am supposed to interpret that particular statute? I, I, may, I may even look at uh, dictionaries. Uh, so there, there are lots of different tools that I have. But what is, is, is primary uh, often in terms of, of, of the exercise when I'm interpreting something that uh, seems to be ambiguous is I want to know, is there anything in what Congress has done in, in the materials that it, it has provided that can help me understand that statutory, uh, that statutory meeting. And that uh, is uh, uh, legislative history. Legislative history refers to the materials that accompany the uh, uh, enactment of legislation. And when I think in terms of, of, of um, legislative history, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, of uh, uh, what I think are the most reliable indicia of uh, of, 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 of what Congress was doing. And that is, uh, first of all, the uh, conference committee report, which is the, uh, represents the final uh, deal between the House and the Senate. House passes a bill, Senate passes a bill. They differ. Uh, the leaders appoint a committee known as a conference committee to work out, iron out the differences. Sometimes that conference committee uh, report actually becomes the bill itself that is, uh, that is, that is enacted. Um, I look at the um, floor statements of the managers and the leaders of the bill as the bill is being uh, enacted. Um, uh, those are, all, are usually scripted colloquially and, and give you a sense of, of what the, the, the deal is. And I, I also uh, will look at the uh, committee reports uh, of each uh, chambers. But there is really a hierarchy of, uh, of reliability um, in all this. And uh, why do I look at these materials? It's because Congress says that this is helpful in terms of understanding what, what uh, they were doing. Legislative history is not the law. It is not the law. But it can help us understand what the law means. and that. Um, to ignore uh, legislative history uh, is to basically say uh, we are not going to pay any attention to what it is that Congress, members of the House, members of the Senate, their committees, the leadership thought was important in understanding that uh, what Congress was, uh, w was doing. Sometimes legislative history provides no light at all. Uh, sometimes it's so ambiguous, there's nothing you can, you can do with it. Um, I understand that. My point is a simple one. I don't think that a priori uh, we should exclude legislative history uh, just because it is not the, the law itself. There, 
there's sort of an irony in all this. You know, you, you'll, you'll read in the legal literature about uh, this person's a textualist and doesn't look to legislative history. This person uh, is, uh, looks at legislative history. Um, what I think that literature and that discussion obscures is that within Congress itself, within Congress itself, there is a bipartisan agreement. Uh, I'm sure there are some exceptions, but generally there's a bipartisan consensus, Republicans and Democrats, that legislative history and the materials that accompany uh, uh, the, the bills um, are, uh, are important. Uh, if you go to any hearing, uh, you'll find Senator Charles Grassley asking uh, virtually every Supreme Court nominee, what is your view about legislative history? Because I think he, he will say it's, 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 da it's darn important. So uh, it, it, this bipartisan consensus only uh, fortifies my view that we should not be cavalier in, in rejecting um, as a matter of principle uh, legislative history in the interpretation of statutes. So, so going back to my example, and then, then I'll finish with that. So when I look at the conference uh, committee uh, report, what is that conference committee report? It says explicitly that uh, expert consulting fees uh, shall be uh, included as part of the costs. So that, to me, is useful information. Now, the argument could be made, well, shouldn't it have just been in the bill? Well, that would have been uh, better from a judge's point of view in the sense it makes our life easier. But are we free to ignore what Congress in that critical document, the conference committee report, has said we should look at? And my argument is that, in, in judging statutes, is that respect for the institution of Congress requires that we try to do what we can to discern what it is that uh, Congress thinks uh, is useful for us to understand in interpreting their work. Thank you, Bob. Um, you know, when, when I went to law school, and I suspect we went to law school about the same time, it wasn't all that long ago, about 40 years ago, the, I uh, <laughs> uh, see your perspective changes when you get older, but uh, uh, statutory construction was all about legislative history. And then this guy uh, named Antonin Scalia came along, uh, and um, one of Jeff Sutton's, uh, one of the many great things on his resume is that he was, a, he was a, one of Justice Scalia's first clerks. He worked, he clerked for Justice Scalia when he came on the court. And, and he um, had a very different view of this, this topic. So Jeff, why don't you t tell us about that and, and as a segue into your own thoughts about what, what Judge Chasm just Sure, uh, thank yeah. you, Jeremy. It's, yeah. it's wonderful to be here. Yeah. It's an honor to be here and it's great to be up here sharing the stage with the two of you. Um, what, in that Arlington case, were you affirmed? The, no. Uh, the, the attorney's fees, uh, <laughs> expert's fees case? No. <laughs> One of the things I'm very, uh, I made sure to do in my book is to include cases where I was reversed. I mean, this is, and so. I, I, I love Bob, you're the best, yeah. I, I, you're such a great judge. Uh, he has two other illustrations where he's affirmed in the book, uh, and you need to read the book, it, show it to him, uh, Judging Statutes, it's a great book, it's accessible to law, lawyers and non-lawyers alike, I loved it. Um, so let me give you the Scalia perspective um, and, uh, and, uh, and segue a little into my own. Um, so uh, he would have had a pretty strong view about that case, and he would have had a pretty strong view about legislative history. I mean, just as a slight asterisk, he, he was not an absolutist. He did think you could use legislative history to, um, you know, if, if someone was claiming that an interpretation of the statute was absurd, he thought it appropriate to see, well, if the legislature actually talked about this in the committee reports, that might show it wasn't absurd. They actually were thinking of doing this. So that was a way to contradict an absurdity argument. And I don't think he ever said this in a case, but I'm pretty confident in reading law, this thing he did with Brian Garner, he agreed that you can use legislative history like dictionaries, because the point of a dictionary is to understand how the people would understand the words being put into text. And so, for example, if you have a 
technical bankruptcy or security statute and the word security is used in the text, it would not be improper to be looking at the legislative history, not to see if they defined it in the legislative history, but to see that they're using the word security in its bankruptcy sense and not you know, national defense, some other usage. So I think he, he did think that was okay, but by and large, um, his seeming mission in life was to put a scarlet letter on le legislative history. I guess we put a big LH on you, Bob, uh, <laughs> if Justice Scalia was here, and, and say that it's forbidden. And, you know, I, I'm going to explain why he thought that and then offer my, some thoughts on it. Um, you know, so first of all, his, um, he was an administrative law professor uh, before he went on the court, and I think if you're trying to understand him, both as a constitutional law judge and a statutory interpreter, He's very focused on separation of powers, uh, which really reduces to the question, who decides? So to him, that was all important, separation of powers. And you know, a law's got to go through both houses. The president's got to sign it into law. The president doesn't sign the legislative history into law. Congress doesn't enact the legislative history. So they're free to do whatever they want. But when it gets to the third branch to interpret it, he thought it appropriate to focus only what was enacted. And I really, you know, we had a lot of explanations for this, but I think the key one was a separation of powers, who decides point. Um, another way of thinking about it, and this is, I think, something one of his law clerks, uh, John Manning at Harvard, ex explained it. Um, think of legislation, it's easy to think of it in, in today's environment, um, as a form of trench warfare, where you've got two sides um, competing about something, about what to do on it. and. Um, Usually they don't merge. Usually there's a gap between them um, and you stop at some point. Sometimes they don't enact it. They can't get enough votes for whatever the reasons. The, co the Constitution makes it very difficult to enact lo laws. Um, but sometimes they do pass it, but they're still separated. Uh, one side's on one, you know, with a group of people pushing for one pers perspective on this. The other side's pushing another perspective. And at some point they stop. And I think the Scalia perspective is to honor where they stopped and not give advantages to one side or the other by trying to fill in that gap. And if they stopped at attorney's fees, uh, it's too bad. It doesn't make sense. I wouldn't call it absurd. It doesn't make sense. I certainly agree with that. But they did stop at attorney's fees. And for whatever reason, they couldn't get expert fees in there. And so you have to honor where things stopped. Um, now, I think. Um, he didn't win the fight on legislative history. Um, he and Justice Thomas, probably the only justice in history that consistently would not use it uh, as a general matter and consistently dissent or concur separately when it was used. Um, so in that sense, uh, sticking with the military, they did lose um, that war. But um, the, the battle that I, I would say was won and that Jeremy's referring to is there really is a pre-1986 approach to statutory interpretation and a post-1986 approach to statutory interpretation. And you know, if you go back and read 1970s, 1960s statutory interpretation cases, you really will see um, a court much more focused on legislative history and, and just a looser form of interpretation. And I think um, you know, Justice Kagan, in a speech at Harvard a couple of years ago, confirmed the point when she said. We're all textualists now, and I think implicit in that, and I think Bob and I would agree on this, that um, we are better off. It, it, I, think, I think courts are a little more attentive to text, more respectful of text, and I think that's actually quite healthy. I mean, I don't think it was a good sign when, you know, you, there really is a decision that began this way. Um, you know, the legislative history is unclear, so we're going to look to the text. I mean. <laughs> that, I mean, that really shows a, a misapprehension of the Constitution and the way lawmaking is done. So that kind of bad old day is gone. Um, but but now, now what are we doing and what's really going on? And this is a, a, th a point where maybe Justice Scalia was a victim of his own success. But one, one thing I don't care for about today, and it's I guess our proclivity for labels, um, is we now have textualists and purposivists. We have people that use legislative history and sin, and people that are pure and don't use legislative mm -hmm. history. And that does, just seems to me unfortunate, and I think an inaccurate way of thinking about what judges really do. Um, I, I think what judges really do and what's really going on is not dichotomies, either ors, but this spectrum mm 
that starts this way, that every judge reads the facts section first, and no judge I've ever met doesn't have a reaction to that facts section, sometimes informed by their pre-existing knowledge of the law, but certainly a reaction to the facts, the equities. And then, of course, they have to turn to the law section of the brief. And the spectrum you get with judges is how much law it takes to constrain them from following their initial reaction to the fact pattern. Because everyone has a reaction to the fact pattern. It would be really unusual and even disappointing if they didn't. So that's, what, that's what's going on, and that's the spectrum. It's not textualist purpose of this. Um, I will say for my own purposes in 15 years, I can't think of a case where legislative history made a difference in the case to me. Um, I've joined some opinions that use it. Um, I don't tend to mention it in my own opinions. Um, it's not because I think it's sinful. I, I, don't think it, I just don't think it helps that much in most cases. But I really can't think of a case where it made the difference in my vote. Um, the other thing, I guess the other reticence I have about it, which is much more practical than doctrinal, is that we judges, we sit in groups of three at the court, the group of nine, we have enough things to disagree about. Um, I, I really don't want to add another plane where we can disagree, where it's a whole body of, you might call it evidence of what the legislature meant, but it's hard enough to figure out, to get agreement on text, context, the canons, precedent. You add legislative history, history to the mix, you're really inviting another source of disagreement, which I, I really, in my own experience, forget what Justice Scalia or anyone else has said, it's a practical matter. I just haven't found it illuminating this or that case. Um, the example of the reasonable attorney's fees and expert fees, that's a, that is an example where it really would make a difference. And I haven't, I just haven't had that case where it's so stark. But um, that's a reticence point as opposed to an absolutist point. You know, the, the case that comes to my mind in listening to both of you is the second healthcare case, you know, with the King versus Burwell. King, King versus Burwell, where the, the, the language talked about an exchange established by the state. And um, the majority said, but if you read that in context, uh, they, they clearly are not limiting it to that. Um, it's a six to three decision, as I recall, and, and Justice Scalia is one of the dissenters. So that's not a legislative history case, but it's, it, it, he would, if I read the tea leaves there is it wouldn't even go so far as to look at context if the text is what it is. Would, is, is that fair? Uh, no, I th he's a pretty, he, yeah. I, think, I think the thing, he, um, he was not happy in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> yeah, you can see the, so, the yeah. evidence yeah. is there yeah. Uh, yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I'd yeah. make two comments yeah. about it, and I think Bob will have a comment about it, because I yeah. think um, this confirms a lot of what he's saying in the book. But, um, First of all, Chief Justice Roberts, in writing the majority, does not use legislative history. His explanation is that, if you remember, it was an unusual bill, how it got through and how it became law. So I think that wasn't making an absolutist point, but it just was not relevant. I think the thing about Kring versus Bur Burwell, which really is illustrative of a debate going on, is that is a purpose of this case. That is a case where the majority is driven by the, the big picture almost asking themselves, you know, what would the legislature that passed this law do with this dispute? Um, now, that's a very high level of generality in, um, in terms of thinking about how to handle the case. And, but, but the Roberts perspective, if you look at the purpose of this, boy, and you know, we, we say that if there's not a state exchange, you don't get this very significant credit. His perspective, Chief Justice Roberts' perspective, was that's really gonna undermine the goal of the law. Now, I think the other side of that, and this is why I think it was a hard case, said, you know, that's just question begging because there's another purpose for having that particular provision, and that other purpose was to drive the states to create exchanges. That was the point. The point was to punish them if they didn't create exchanges by denying them this really significant monetary carrot. Um, so, I think what was hard about the case and hard at the court was which big picture purpose should win. And um, so I, I don't know, Bob, but you, yeah. I, just a few thoughts. Um, first on, on King v. Burwell, I think that that is a classic um, 
exposition of, of the so-called purposivist approach. It is straight out of the Hart and Sachs approach, uh, Harvard Law School. No, the Katzman approach. Well, That's what we call it now. Uh, no, it's, uh, but it is, <laughs> Sachs was one of my professors, so you're right. <laughs> and it's the idea of, of, of saying, uh, what, what do we think Congress was trying to do? And uh, in a circumstance where the court felt that legislative history was uh, not particularly useful, uh, where <coughs> the lawmaking process, we now have a process that's uh, been termed by the po political scientist Barbara Sinclair as unorthodox lawmaking, which is not traditional lawmaking and the problems that that um, entails. So I, I think that um, that, that decision is, uh, will be viewed in that way. I think it also uh, will be viewed as, uh, over time, as one of those cases that uh, potentially undermines Chevron. Uh, deference, the idea that uh, the um, court should defer uh, routinely to uh, agencies' decisions with respect to uh, ambiguous statutes or regulations as long as that um, uh, interpretation of the agency is reasonable. And what the court says in, this, in that case was, we're not going to defer to the IRS's interpretation uh, because the IRS doesn't have special expertise in this healthcare area, and unless Congress has explicitly delegated to the IRS that responsibility, where there are uh, cases involving uh, uh, large issues of, of uh, public policy, the court is uh, going to undertake its own independent uh, analysis. And that move, I think, over time, could be um, uh, a very significant. And uh, we also have Justice Gorsuch, who has been uh, critical of Chevron deference. So King v. Burwell be, may be noted over time for that uh, larger purpose. Just a couple of things in response to, uh, to Jeff. Uh, I fully agree that uh, Justice Scalia <coughs> had an extraordinary impact uh, on uh, statutory uh, interpretation. And I think that his criticisms about the um, abuses of uh, legislative history are, are well taken. And I think that uh, we are in a better place where we begin with a text rather than the, uh, the legislative history. Um, I think the answer is not to jettison uh, legislative history, uh, but to look at that those parts of legislative history that uh, we can think of as reliable, because that, that, that narrows search costs and disagreements among, among uh, judges. As Senator Hatch put it, the problem of uh, legislative history, it's not its, it's not its use, it's abuse. And so if you can uh, look at legislative history, uh, it can be helpful. If you've got a, a, an ambiguous statute and, and it's broad, um, if you don't look at materials of Congress that can help you, then that just increases the discretion of the judge mm. to be judicially active. Whereas, to the extent that there, there are legitimate, uh, reliable signs that can narrow the, uh, can, can help focus understanding, then I, I think that's a better, that's a better uh, approach. And, uh, if we can look at dictionaries, if we can look at extra textual uh, sources that, that, uh, that Congress, uh, uh, you know, like, legislati like legislative history, why not look at legislative history if we're willing to look at extra textual sources? Well, let me, let me kind of reframe this, this discussion a little bit <laughs> so that it'll tie into what we were hearing about earlier this morning. So, you know, the, the idea of um, the role of the judiciary and, and the, the scope of judicial review. So we went through an era where legislative history had a much larger role. Uh, clearly, in the last 30 years, it's, that role has diminished, which has really been reversed, and now, now we start with the text. Uh, and, and people are, are, even people like Justice Kagan are saying we're all textualists now. Um, but this is, there's a larger question of what, 
how do, does the judiciary convey respect for Congress uh, in, in a separation of powers? Uh, what is the best way to do that? And then the next obvious question seems to me is in terms of the legitimacy of the judiciary with the, with the public and with the other branches. How does the way we approach this task of statutory construction fit into that? I mean, if, if, we're, if we can just do whatever we want, and you know, we, I think we get criticized sometimes for, we, you just do whatever you want, and then you, you, you work back and make it look pretty, but I mean, basically you just do whatever you want. Which of these forms of analysis, I think, is most likely to contribute to our legitimacy? Yeah, no, I love that yeah. question. Yeah. I, I, I think we might, it'll be interesting to see our thoughts yeah. about it. Yeah. Let, me, let me suggest this way to think about it and uh, this question to ask yourself and see if you agree with my assessment of things. If someone uh, who didn't know anything about American law chose to assess what American look, law looked like and how American judges approached the task of interpretation and their only source of evidence were the confirmation hearings of U.S. Supreme Court justices for the last 50 years. They would take the view that it's a pretty formal group. Uh, they would probably take the view that, I'm gonna have an asterisk here, but they'd probably take the, the view by and large that the Scalia perspective won. They're originalists, they're textualists, and, and then if that same person, or you will actually get somebody different, and now they say, I'm going to assess what American law looks like by looking exclusively to the U.S. reports. They would probably say, I don't think the textualist won. I don't think the originalist won. I think there's a lot of everything, but probably largely uh, pragmatic across the board. So before you jump to the conclusion, am I indicting all justices in their confirmation hearings for not telling the truth? That's not what I'm saying at all. I think what's going on in a confirmation hearing, um, and the reason the answers go in this direction is they're being pushed uh, primarily by people skeptical, those are the hard questions, and they're being pushed about how they're gonna exercise power. And the nat natural inclination is that you're gonna resist opportunities to exercise power in new ways, and you're gonna be power constraining and when you re look at the U.S. reports, you find lots of doctrines that are not power constraining, they're power liberating. And uh, legislative history to me, and this is maybe fundamentally what it comes down to, is it power enhancing? Does it give judges more opportunity to do things they probably otherwise couldn't do? Or is it power, you know, not using it, power restricting, which I, I guess is the way I see it. Now, Bob correctly points out um, Justices always get a question about, well, will you, will you use legislative history? Mm -hmm. Justice Scalia doesn't like it. I'm kind of curious. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a hard question to answer. Um, you know, it's a little bit like an artist asking whether you'll buy any of his initial, dra his initial paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't want to say, no, that's crap. I mm -hmm. want, I'll buy the finished product, <laughs> but everything else is pretty lousy. Um, so I, I just feel like the setting of that question is pretty difficult. And, um, but I really, I do think there is a very big difference between what judges say they're gonna do at their confirmation hearings and what they do. And I think it's just a natural tendency at those hearings to talk about doing less. That's the, that's the theme you get. And when you read the US reports, particularly over the last 60 years, you would not say they've done less. Um, you might like that they've done a lot, but I'm not, I'm not making a judgment mm -hmm. uh, on it. So that's the way I think about it. I, I think, I mean, I think it's a great question, uh, a way to think about it, Jeff, but I, 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 would all, I would say that using legislative history is actually a way to do less. Yeah, no, I, I thought you would say here. that. I thought you would say so, that. <laughs> that, that, that that's, that's number one. Uh, uh, and number two, if, if we think in terms of uh, thought experiments, uh, let's have a thought experiment where the uh, courts decree that henceforth, they will no longer look at legislative history. What do you think the reaction in Congress, the bipartisan uh, reaction in Congress uh, would be? Um, it would be one of the, the single most unifying moments uh, in this polarized uh, era. And if that is the uh, reaction, then it should at least give us pause as to whether we can jettison that 
that legislative history um, altogether. I want to, though, uh, stress something that uh, uh, Jeff said and that I agree with, and that is, fully agree with, that judging is, can't be reduced to whether you're a purposivist or a, or a textualist. Um, judging is really a common sense inquiry for the most part. It doesn't exist uh, in this lofty plane of theory. You're presented with a, a problem, a case. You're trying to make sense of the words of those uh, presented to you. And uh, you begin with the text, and the text may resolve the question. You know, I, if I look at a text, um, and I look at it in the context of <coughs> the statutory structure, and I, uh, I can resolve it, I'm more or less done. So um, it's not like we're looking necessarily to just go out and make more work for ourselves by looking at legislative <laughs> history. It's only when I think it's, 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 it's called on. Um, textualists and purposivists, so-called, we're, we're all doing a bit of both uh, in, our, in our analyses. And, and uh, uh, as we think about this debate, we should recognize um, how, by and large, uh, we do the same things. We th there isn't a huge gulf in the way that we, we approach the task. It's really at, at the margins, and it's really a question of nuance more than anything else. So, so Jeff said something earlier that actually echoed something we heard a couple weeks ago at our appellate judge symposium from Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel laureate who's uh, studied uh, decision making. And you said that you, you read the facts and you have a response to the facts, you have a reaction to the facts. And then the question is, when do you find that there's enough law to stop you from doing what you wanted to do? I'm inclined to do, right? Yeah. And, and that's basically what Professor Kahneman told this room full of circuit judges, that they do. You know, but it sort of, it sort of contradicts the, the, uh, the, the popular notion of how judges make decisions. So how does that fit into this discussion that we're having? Would it, would it be that a, a, a textualist in the Scalia mold would, would stop a lot sooner? Uh, or uh, that, that a, a purpose, purposivist in the, in, the, in the Katzman mode would stop later or would look at more things? I mean, is, is that what it comes down to? Yeah, so I mean, I think there's, I would say there's two things going yeah. on there. So yeah. yes, I, I would say that the textualist, Judge Posner calls them formalists, would, um, it would be a lot easier for law to get in their way, law to limit their power because they would more easily say or more readily say, hey, um, I'm stuck. This is really unfortunate. I really wanted to go the other way, so I'm stuck. Um, the thing I would add to this, and I get this all the time when I'm at law schools, professors love to ask this question, and it's a fair question, albeit an extremely frustrating question. Uh, okay, Jeff, will you say that? And, you know, that's the right thing to say, and your opinions say the right thing, but, you know, those are just opinions, but, you know, you can't control your self-conscious, sub your subconscious, and how do you really know what you're doing? And um, and I always respond to them, and I say, well, let me give you a subconscious <laughs> response. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's just what I do. I wait a few seconds. Uh, and uh, it's always really persuasive. Uh, you know, what, the, but this is where it's, you know, I'm so glad to, and I, in fact, I wish I, get, I could sit with Bob. Um, he's such a great judge. But this is where it's so helpful to have groups of three group of nine or whatever it might be, because that, by having to talk through these things and figure out, like if we had that attorney's fees, expert fees case, you know, we would have eventually realized, you know, this is a, this is a purpose, purpose of this textualist problem, and that, that's what would have eventually happened. But by talking through it, we would have gotten to that point, and other times we would have maybe realized, yeah, I guess I, there is a little bit of a bias creeping in, or I haven't quite gotten over my reaction to the facts. So, so to the extent there is this risk of the subconscious biases leaking in, it really helps that we have each other, I would say. Do you ever sit by designation? Anytime, anytime I'm asked. Anytime, <laughs> I clerk there. I'd, I, I'd love the idea of seeing the courtroom from another angle. Uh, that'd be great. <laughs> Bob, what do you think? I mean, is, it, is, it, is it really these, these philosophical differences just a question of what parts of the toolbox you use and don't use? I, I, I think so. Um, 
and um, uh, I, I, I really I agree with, with, with what Jeff was, was saying um, in terms of, of uh, how we think about these things. Uh, we stop sooner or later, um, and that's an interesting way to, to think about it. I think that for myself, uh, in terms of the way my own brain works, um, I wouldn't be stopping, if I was looking at a text that was, you know, let's say ambiguous, I wouldn't be stopping sooner. I would be constantly tortured by trying to figure out what I was oh, supposed to do. Let me spare you. Yeah. Let me spare you. <laughs> what I, I was doing so I, that. I, I'm going to play doctor yeah, right yeah. now. I, I can help you. So that therefore, <laughs> therefore looking at anything that can help me do my job uh, is something that I, I uh, you know, I, uh, I welcome. Um, so uh, it's, uh, you know, the world's a complicated yeah. place. So you're, you're, you're tortured, but right. I'm happy, but wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's a trade-off. I'm willing so to just, accept uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about one other topic, but, but for those of you who are not law geeks, and, and even those of you who are, one of, there's a wonderful case that the Supreme Court had a couple years ago called United States versus Yates. And yeah. it was about, it was about uh, somebody who had, was uh, accused of smuggling uh, fish illegally and, and uh, threw the evidence overboard. And, uh, the Coast Guard caught them, and the question was whether it violated a particular statute. And it was a five to four decision by the court, but read Justice Kagan's opinion. It'll, if, you, if you like law at all, you'll laugh for a long time. It, and she talks about all this stuff, but she does it in a very The, question, the statutory very, very question is whether way, a yeah. fish is a tangible yeah. Ob object. Yeah, it's, uh, so that's the statutory <laughs> phrase. Yeah. Um, <laughs> answer yes, uh, but when you look at the context of the statute and the reason why they passed the statute, Looks a lot harder. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's really, really fun reading for. Because the statute yeah, was yeah, passed yeah. in the context yeah. of, uh, of Enron. Yeah. And had nothing to do with fish. Uh, fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which opinion did you prefer in that case? <laughs> <laughs> the, the Kagan opinion's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. It is pretty good. Yeah. It, it's just funny. I mean, that's why I like yeah. it. So, because I'm nonpartisan. So it's a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Jeff, you, you're, you have a book that's coming out uh, soon that, that actually ties into this topic, um, and it's about uh, the role of state Supreme Courts in state law, which is federalism, which is another piece of the of Hamiltonian uh, vision. Um, and so how does, that, how does that fit in with what we're talking about here? Thank you, thank you. Uh, um, so this uh, book's called 51 Imperfect Solutions, state, States in the Making of American Constitutional Laws. Folks, a little more on constitutional law, but it applies to statutes as well. Um, and the point of the book is that... Um, Published by Oxford Press. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank Coming you. out in... In May, <laughs> May. May, May 8th. Uh, and uh, so the point of the book is um, when we think of the states and American law, we largely think of states as um, affecting law in a negative way, um, a negative example of conduct of the states leading to a response, usually by the federal government, often by the federal, U.S. Supreme Court, interpreting the U.S. Constitution. So, you know, the very best example of that, understood by every 13-year-old in this country, um, would be Jim Crow, followed by Brown versus Board of Education. Um, so, um, I have no problem with that story. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a great story, and I, I talk about it a little bit in the book, but um, the point of the book is actually to talk about other stories involving the states where they don't set a negative example, but where they set a positive example, because I feel like that's undertaught and underappreciated today. Um, so, you know, for example, this is, um, I'm, I'm sure I'll never get invited back here, but I really don't care for the name of the center. Um, it's, you know, 1776 to 1787 was the greatest period of Constitution writing, not just in this country, but in the world. And that's all before the summer of 18, 1787. The greatest constitution writing that ever took place in the world was at the state level, by the colonies. Um, in fact, um, most of the US Constitution and all the individual rights are plagiarized. Um, it's, it's all borrowed from the states here and there. And um, you know, the, really, the key innovation when it comes to liberty is federalism. But everything else, you can find a source, which is no surprise, most of the framers and, summer 1787 came from the states and actually John Adams, Madison, whomever had been involved there. 
So that's point one. Point two, you know, the first 150 years of American history, all of the individual rights litigation, not all of it, but virtually all of it, uh, takes place at the states, state courts, state constitutions. If you were foolish enough to ex examine American constitutional law texts from the mid-19th century, you'd see four-fifths of the texts were devoted to state constitutional decisions. That's where all the action was. And there are actually some underappreciated stories, so I'll tell you one quick story that I think illustrates this point. Um, you know, most of you know the Buck versus Bell story. Um, speaking of the Taft Court, this happens in 1927. Uh, it's an 8-1 decision um, by Oliver, the great Oliver Wendell Holmes upholding uh, eugenics legislation, which is to say giving states, uh, this, in this case Virginia, the right to involuntarily sterilize individuals in various homes throughout the states. Um, so, you know, that's an um, infamous decision. It, it's still good law, believe it or not, but it's not something anyone relies on. It's not any, something anyone thinks is a good decision. It was, even though society at 8 1. So that's the story that most people know when it comes to eugenics, involuntary sterilization, and the courts. Uh, there's two parts of that story that most people don't know, which have something interesting, I, I think, for us all to learn. One, is that before 1927, uh, there were eight other cases in the state courts. Uh, well, actually, one was in the district courts, so it's really seven cases before then in the state courts. And of those seven, six of the seven get it right from the verdict of history, rely on state constitutions or, and or the U.S. Constitution, either due process or equal protection, to invalidate the state's eugenics and voluntary sterilization laws. Uh, so there's, that's a, a good example of a positive example when it comes to American constitutional law, albeit one the U.S. Supreme Court didn't learn anything from. Justice Holmes never mentioned these decisions. They were cited in the briefs. He doesn't acknowledge them. He doesn't argue, acknowledge the arguments made there, ignores them. But anyway, it's an example of a story where the states get it right. Um, but here's the part of the story that's most disappointing to me and where I really think we need to rethink things as, as citizens, lawyers, and judges. What's really disappointing is what happens after 1927, because after 1927, with the Buck versus Bell decision, you not only get the upholding of the existing laws, quite a few more states enact laws. No one goes back to the state courts. No one uses the state constitutions to invalidate these laws. And I guess it's because the US Supreme Court, the great Oliver Wendell Holmes, had said three generations of imbeciles are enough. And everyone took that somehow as gospel. So there's something wrong with our American legal culture in a setting where the states had already done the right thing under our Constitution. They have the authority after 1927 to rely on their own state constitutions or their own legislation by just getting rid of these eugenics laws. And they didn't. So as a result, over 75, 75 years, 60,000 individuals in this country are involuntarily sterilized. The movement only comes to an end, not through the courts, but through the ADA in 1990, and then some states you know, passing of anti-discrimination laws against individuals with disabilities. Um, so there's something, that, so the point of the book is to, one, tell some stories that show the states have actually done some positive things when it come to, comes to individual rights. Um, we're not gonna forget the Jim Crow story, but we're also not gonna be driven exclusively by it, and you know, my hope is to get us as a country to think more about state courts and state constitutions as an, another avenue for protecting individual liberties. And I, uh, I was asking Jeff earlier, uh, Goodman Liu, who's a justice on the California Supreme Court, um, and I, I suspect on political issues, and I think that's not of really our concern here, probably doesn't see eye to eye with Jeff on, on, on everything, but on this issue, they're in total, total agreement. Oh, yeah. Ju Justice yeah. Brennan and yeah. Justice Scalia agree yeah. on yeah. this. Yeah. Now, this is, this is actually the whole yeah. problem with this mission I'm on. Yeah. The problem with what I'm talking about is that it's entirely neutral. Um, uh, <laughs> no one likes that. It's, it's, incre it's yeah. just about yeah. impossible to right. sell something yeah. that's neutral yeah. these days. Yeah. Uh, so, but I'm working on it. All right. uh, but no, Scalia, his last majority opinion for the yeah. court, Kansas versus Carr, talks about state experimentation under state constitutions. Justice Brennan wrote a landmark article in 1977 saying the same thing. So if Brennan and Scalia agree on something, that's the definition of truth. <laughs>
So, so um, Je uh, Bob, you want to add anything to this? It's, it's, it's a, you know, I think it's relevant to our larger purpose because federalism was certainly one of the hotly debated issues at the framing. But what, what do you think of this? I, I can't wait to, to uh, for May eighth. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be reading and learning, as, is, as this always. This is getting too transparent, how much we're helping each other Re reading, sell books. Read, reading, yeah. <laughs> reading, reading and learning. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, with respect to our own topic in terms of uh, uh, statutes, it's also interesting to see how different states are yes. in terms of their uh, regime with respect to the interpretation of statutes. There are some states that um, are uh, very clear about what kinds of legislative history can be used. There are other states that don't have a uh, history of using legislative history or a culture of using legislative history. Um, and I think we can all learn from the various different uh, states in terms of how they do things and uh, can be instructive as to how we can do things, how we can do things better. And uh, uh, I know Hans Lindy years ago used to say that we have to look to the states and uh, I think it's so important now more than ever that we do so and I think it's fantastic that Jeff is shining a spotlight as a crusader in this issue. Well we have a, a couple minutes so they'll follow Jeff Rosen's example. Any, any last uh, thoughts you want to leave our group with? Sure. Uh, well, you might ask yourself why a federal judge would care about state courts and state constitutions. Um, I'm very anxious about the path we're on, going back to the topic of judicial review, the last panel. Um, I see two options. Path A is the one we're on, um, and uh, it appears to me, I'm not making a value judgment about court decisions, but it appears to me over the last several decades you have uh, liberal constitutionalizing of certain values, um, relying on this clause or that clause, response of, well, can't beat them, join them, the conservatives constitutionalizing this value or that value, and it just keeps going up and up. Um, that's fine. We Americans love our rights, and if that's the way we do it, great. Uh, what I'm very anxious about is I don't know how we'll fill those positions when we have vacancies, because that's an incredible amount of power. So there's path B, which is my preferred path, which is a detente. There's actually a New York Times article uh, last week. I can't believe like I'd written it about how, you know, is the judiciary messing up politics? It's a great article. Uh, so path B is a detente. Both sides agree no more or even retract some. Uh, you might ask yourself, um, I think that was an agreement with what I was saying. Uh, you, might, uh, you might ask yourself, how can that happen? Because we Americans do prize our rights and I think that's a really serious question. And that's where the state courts and the state constitutions come in. Um, I'm very happy with state courts being very aggressive under their own state constitutions. I don't care for winner take all. I understand why the lobbyists want winner take all. I understand why the interest groups want winner take all. But if you like winner take all, I promise you, you're going to find some things you really don't like because you're going to win some and you're going to lose some. And if you want, it's who decides. Do you want the court deciding this or do you want, you know, states or Congress deciding it? And I prefer path B to path A. Bob? <laughs> I just been great to be here. Uh, one final thought, and that is that um, when we think about this era of so much discord, and we think about ways that uh, at least the branches can work better together, can respect uh, one another, I think that when judges respect the work product of, of Congress, uh, it's a way of fostering uh, better relations and uh, understanding, mutual understanding. That's not to say that there won't be friction. Friction is inherent in the process, but that we can at least eliminate some needless fr friction by uh, honoring what it is that Congress had in mind in terms of its work product. So we move from the eloquent, <laughs> the eloquence of Quiet. Jeff Sutton to the mundaneness of me. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. And I, I think you can see why these 
two judge slash authors are such great treasures to our judiciary. They, they are such deep thinkers both, even though they don't always see things the same way. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs> And uh, I think that concludes our public sessions, and would really like to especially express thanks to the, to the members and, and other public members of the NCC who joined us for this session this morning. Thanks very much. <laughs>